On an ordinary street in England, an extraordinary tragedy as two children wake to discover their mother lying on the floor. The eldest son, just six years old, called 999. He told the operator that she had blood all over her. She was lying on her back with her eyes open. The children's father is missing. There's no sight of Andrew Taverner. He's gone, he's fled, he's into the wind. The first thing I heard was the following morning, my sister um, rang me to tell me that Andy Tavs had been at the train station, that he tried to jump in front of a train. When he approached Mr. Taverner, the train driver, and uh, said, what have you been doing? Uh, he indicated that he just wanted to die. What had happened that night between Andrew and Claire Taverner? They had met, they had married. Now one appeared to be dead and the other about to die. When Claire was 22 years old, she thought she had it all. A doting fiancé, a gorgeous new baby. She was content with the life she had built for herself in her hometown of Nailsea, Somerset. Claire is a human being who is highly charismatic. She's incredibly witty. Her friends respond to her in a really great way because she's so popular. She's one of those individuals that really is the center. She's the person that you definitely wanted to party with you. She was an outdoorsy girl. She loved riding horses. She had two dogs. She worked in the old farmhouse pub. It is while working at the farmhouse pub that she meets Andrew Taverner. Taverner is a tree surgeon, so he's got a really regular career. Um, he's an individual who's had a relationship before. He's got a child from that relationship, and it doesn't seem to have been massively eventful. But when he meets Claire, he feels like she's the love of his life, and she tells people that she is the one for him. Andrew is 40 years old, 18 years older than Claire. He's from the village of Nailsey, close to Bristol, which is a rural community. And he was a very physical and tough guy. The landlady at the railway inn pub in Bristol knew the couple. Andy was a regular. He played pool on the county team with her husband. Andy's been playing pool here I reckon maybe seven or eight years. It was a team of about 50 people. He was a great character who always brought a lot of enthusiasm to the team. He was known as a gentle giant. He was always very willing to help anyone out. Just generally, he was a pleasant person to be around. He was enjoyed as part of the team, and he was always very positive. What's interesting about Tavner is that he doesn't come across in any negative way. When people are asked about his nature, he's straightforward and he's very kind. So he's somebody that doesn't strike you as having any particular potential. Within months of meeting Andrew Tavener, Claire was pregnant. The couple thrilled. They tell friends that they're planning to spend the rest of their lives together. This was a whirlwind relationship that turned into a whirlwind marriage. So, on a beautiful English spring day in April 2013, Claire and Andrew gather their loved ones together at Clifton Hall. And he tells all his friends that she's simply the best thing that's ever happened to him. Wedding photographer Simon Burns likes to get to know couples before their big day so he can capture their personalities in the pictures. To be at someone's wedding and to be asked to be their photographer on, you know, one of the biggest days of their life is, is actually a great honour. I think that somebody is giving me that responsibility to capture, to record this big day. One thing struck Simon as out of the ordinary for the usual weddings that he photographed. I do in particular remember Andrew and Claire's wedding. 
I think one of the reasons may be the age difference between Andrew and Claire. I believe there was about 18 years between them, which is always something that stands out. And, and also, I think I remember it because Andrew was a, a, quite a character. He was a jolly character. He was, seemed happy, he seemed quite outgoing, quite loud. He was always having a bit of a joke, a bit of a laugh. To Simon, Claire seemed quiet. I think Claire was a little bit nervous. She was a bit shy as well, so I think that came with that. I don't think Andrew was really nervous. Andrew was outside the hall greeting the guests as they turned up. He was a jolly chap. He was full of, full of energy. Nervous or not, the bride was a picture. Claire was wearing a white wedding dress. It was a shoulderless dress. She had quite a long, well, a medium-sized train at the back of her dress. It wasn't too long. But she also had a nice tiara, the, the veil over her head. I also remember that she um, had her hair with a nice curl coming down in front of her face. And she looked fairly nice indeed. She was a very beautiful bride, I think. So Claire begins her life as Mrs. Taverner. Within a year, they have another baby. The perfect couple, perhaps. But Claire tells friends that Andy was not quite the same after the couple married. I think what becomes very clear about this relationship uh, quite early on is that Andrew feels like this is a very traditional relationship. He's the boss, he's the alpha male, she's the little woman who should stay at home and do what she's told. Quite actually strong beliefs in that direction, it seems. Whilst it appears that there were no obvious signs of problematic behaviour as far as Tavner's violence or aggression or abuse towards Claire is concerned before the marriage, after the marriage there seems to be an upping of controlling behaviours. So she has silly social events to go home and make his tea. He complains about the way that she looks after the household. So there are these incremental shifts in the way that he views her, but also incremental shifts in the way that he feels he has a possession of her. Outwardly, he's still the gentle giant, loved by his mates down the pub. Maybe Andrew does drink a little too much, but he's a key player on the pub pool team. Drinking goes with the territory. I never had any trouble with Andy at all, ever really. And they used to get quite drunk on county days, to say the least. They've come back from their coach trips having been drinking all day. We've got pictures of him pouring. They were all having a turn to pour a beer themselves and things like that, you know, just joining in with everybody else. In public, Andrew is a joker. In private, though, his controlling behavior towards his wife is escalating. In February 2015, there were two reports of domestic violence, one of which involved Tavener allegedly pushing Claire down the stairs. His abuse of her is witnessed on occasions. He calls her friends quite sexist names, and he actually pushes Claire around in front of them. He's not particularly concerned about people thinking that, that he's violent with her. He seems to be quite happy for them to know, which suggests that he feels justified. He feels he's in charge. He's making sure that he's dominating, and he's showing everyone that. Something seems to change in Andrew. Now, whether that's insecurity, about the age difference, about the fact that she's very, very attractive, he's an outdoors working guy, and is he worried about what his wife's gonna do? Something changes inside him. The violence begins. His controlling nature comes to the fore. These culminate in some really quite serious domestic violence incidents where police are called, where she's grabbed by the throat, where he tries to throw her down the stairs. This is the start, the emergence of a very, very serious pattern of violence. It's an escalation in his violent behavior which would worry domestic abuse experts like Jill Barr. Tavener has grabbed Claire round her neck and lifted her off the ground, and this has been done in front of friends. That's saying, look what I can do. Look what I'm doing, and what are you guys gonna do? Two years after they had married, and by February 2015, Andrew Tavener is openly abusing his wife, fueling his apparent rage, the very thing he thought made him popular, drinking. 
He could, he could drink a lot, yes. I don't know what he drank the rest of the time, but anybody who can drink as much as he could and still be OK clearly drank quite a lot. In February 2015, 24 years old mum of two, Claire Taverner, has a steady job, her parents living just down the road. But less than two years into their marriage, Andrew Taverner has turned into someone she doesn't recognise. Claire's found herself in a marriage with a much older man who has very set ideas about their relative roles within that relationship. And Claire finds herself now, after having quite a lot of freedom, a mother, but also somebody who has to keep house for this man, and he's insistent on it. We, we see lots of arguments around whether she's keeping the house tidy enough, you know, whether she is home at the right time. So all of these kind of gendered, roles are being really, really enforced by this man, and that must have been quite a shock for Claire. Friends are starting to notice how much he's drinking. He was a blokey guy. He enjoyed his work, he enjoyed a drink, he loved a glass of cider. He'd often go to the pub, drink far too much. He wouldn't be aggressive, he wouldn't be violent, but he'd be annoying, too loud, and sometimes made a nuisance of himself. He drank far too much, which also led to a drink driving conviction some time ago. Though popular with his pool pals, he could fall out with people. Andrew Tavener is a very thin-skinned individual. He sees um, critique and slights in everything people say. So he's, he's constantly, you know, having petty arguments with people and enforcing his, his opinion enforcing his attitude towards his wife, too. Friends report that Claire would often leave social engagements in order to go home and prepare food for Taverner. And she also claimed that he would make comments about her not keeping the house tidy enough. He's actually quite sexist in his beliefs, and he clearly thinks that Claire is there to serve him as the alpha male, and it's all completely over the top, and it's, it's almost a role he's playing, but inside his head, he actually feels entitled to have that alpha male role, and he is enforcing it through violence. Claire's friends can't help but notice his worsening behaviour. He is hurting Claire in front of them and in the family home. It's kind of, look at me, look what I'm doing, be scared of me, be worried about me. I've got this temper, I've got this strength. I think he picks up a TV uh, at some point and throws it out of the window. Everything is kind of noisy and visual with this man. Two years into their marriage, and Claire lives every day, fearing for her safety. I've been in this situation as a police officer. I've been to houses where there has been violence. Not necessarily an enormous amount of violence, maybe not even any visible injuries, but sometimes you can smell the fear. Sometimes you can smell the fear from the wife, but she does not want to assist you. She does not want to make an allegation. You can sense the atmosphere within these houses, particularly in situations like this where you have a significantly older man, probably an enormously jealous man, a man of some physical means. You drive away from there and you just hope, you hope you don't have to go back again. In 2015, Claire finds the courage to report two instances of domestic violence to the police. She was looking for help. That only fuels Taverner's rage. So she accuses him of violence twice, and also now we see an escalation of his behavior regarding what he feels is betrayal. So he's constantly questioning her and suggesting that she's cheated on him. So he's looking to pick apart the relationship and also the commitment that she has towards it. In one instance reported to the police, Andy tries to throw Claire down the stairs while she's holding their young son. Former police inspector Jill Barr spent 20 years on the force specialising in domestic violence cases. To her, this latest attack was a warning of how bad things could become. 
when you're holding a baby or a young child, how vulnerable was Claire feeling at that point? Um, to then have the father of that child push you, which could have resulted not in just injury to, to, to Claire, but injury to the child as well. And you have to ask the question, what dad, what man would do that to a woman he supposedly loves when she's holding a child? What an, a great example of power and control is that? I can do to you what I want because you're holding our child. What are you going to do? What, you're not in a position to defend yourself. And look what I can do. What Andrew was doing increasingly became common knowledge. He'd done it once, he did it again. He attacked Claire in public. In the second of these incidents, witnessed by several of Claire's friends, Tavener called Claire's friends bitches. He grabbed Claire by the throat, picked her up and shook her. The second incident we're aware of is Claire is picked up by Tavener by her neck in front of people and lifted off the ground. That's very bold, abusive, physical assault in front of people that know them. That's saying to the people around about her, look what I can do. Imagine sitting, watching that, thinking, what can I do? What is going on here? That doesn't look right. But there's no suggestion that at any point MD's intervened to help Claire. So people feel sometimes disabled by seeing things like that. And what that does in for a man like Tavener, it plays into that power and control dynamic. Because let's remember, part of the power and control behavior is to cause isolation. So if you're making friends uncomfortable, in this case, witnessing Claire being grabbed by the neck and picked up off the ground, are you going to put yourself in a position to see that again? Or are you going to turn the other way? Landlady Merrin remembers the incident. It was the talk of the community. One of the friends of Claire Tavener, also named Claire, talked about it in the pub. She was telling me about a time where Andy was on his way home and Claire offered to help Claire Tavener tidy the house because Claire Tavener was really worried that when Andy came home, he'd be really cross because the house wasn't tidy. So she cleaned the kitchen and because she put the dishcloth over the tap instead of where Claire Tavener's would put it, Andy knew that as she hadn't cleaned the kitchen, and pinned her up against the wall because of it. Was it just how he... complete control over someone, which I suppose will happen when someone's so much younger? I don't know. By 2017, Andrew is barely recognisable as the loving husband giggling with his wife at the altar on that day in April 2013. He has isolated her from her friends controls her every move, assaults her when she doesn't behave, and now perhaps her children are at risk. Is it time for Claire to leave? She goes and seeks advice from the Citizens Advice Bureau that she wants to end the relationship. These are signs and symptoms to him that the power and control he's had for so long is ebbing away. She's making plans to leave. Experts point to this moment when a woman decides she's leaving as very dangerous. In 2020, 41% of women murdered by their partners were killed once they had tried to leave. It's one of the most high-risk points in an abusive relationship for the woman, in this case, Claire, to say, do you know what, that's enough, I'm going. We know that that's the loss of power and control, and we know that first three months of somebody like Claire leaving, somebody like Tavener is a high-risk factor for, for homicide. In the winter of 2017, Claire Tavener has begun to plan her life without her violent husband. She agrees to one last Christmas together as a family. Then she's planning her escape. Someone like Andrew is getting more dangerous. So Claire starts having conversations with him about ending the relationship. She talks about moving out. She talks about moving into the pub. And Andrew, is becoming a lot more volatile. So that control that he has over her, he wants to enforce that even stronger now because he's got no arguments left. Now, physical force really is the only thing. He doesn't seem to have that side to him that can charm or manipulate. He literally has his physical strength to win any argument. Prosecutors would soon get to know all about the life and times of Mr. and Mrs. Tavener. Hey, my name's Kerry Malin. I was prosecution counsel in the case against Andrew Tavener. He was charged with murder. All of the witness evidence that uh, the police uh, 
obtained uh, and that they were coexisting for the purposes of the Christmas period um, with very much the idea that post-Christmas Claire would leave with the boys and uh, the relationship would be uh, formally ended. Over Christmas they put on a show. The couple spend New Year's Eve with neighbours. Nobody suspects that this is the beginning of the end for the taverners, but in January Claire begins to put her plan into action. She's been offered a room in the pub where she works to sleep, and she tells her husband she's moving out. Andrew won't allow that. After New Year, things begin to get unbearable for Claire. His bullying, coercive and violent nature is getting worse. He takes her keys from her to prevent her driving away from him. He will do anything to keep her, but she wants out. She decides that she wants to file for a divorce, so she leaves him and starts that procedure. And it's clear at that point that she's got some very clear visions about what she wants for her life, and it doesn't involve a controlling partner. She doesn't want that violence in her world. Andrew Taverner, a so-called alpha male with a fragile ego, cannot understand why his wife would want to leave. He begins to develop a paranoid delusion. Claire is leaving not because he is violent, but because she is seeing another man. Andrew Taverner was driven by jealousy. Driven by jealousy that his wife might be having an affair, despite the fact that there was no evidence of this whatsoever. Other things started happening that just confirmed this paranoid belief about the affair. You know, she was wanting to leave, she was staying out, she might have been talking to her friends. All of this would have been proof positive for him that he was a cuckold. He was being humiliated by this woman. She's showing an enormous amount of strength of character to have the bravery to walk away from this man who has controlled her for such an amount of time. Little does she know, this is putting the danger against her up and up and up. Once she asks for a divorce, this is going to cause problems. Claire Taverner has never been in more danger. This is a violent man. This is a paranoid man and a melodramatic man. Claire wanted to leave him. That would go against all of his kind of macho and sexist belief systems. He's much older than she is. He's violent. He's paranoid. This is a dangerous time for Claire. She probably didn't realize how dangerous. The knowledge that his wife is now having the strength to leave him, he's already been violent to her, significantly violent. This is the thing that will tip him over the edge. Claire Taverner, just 26, is in an abusive marriage. Claire told Taverner that she was going to go and live at the old farmhouse, the pub where she worked. This enraged Taverner, who attempted to throw a television out of the window. He took Claire's car keys so that she couldn't take the children with her. She could not yet move to the pub either, but Claire is determined. From the 3rd of January, she keeps a safe distance from her violent husband. Now you can imagine how this would send him into a spiral of depression. She goes out for four nights on the row, and that seems to be a real trigger point for him. Tavner feels that there's potentially betrayal occurring. Remember, he's constantly been concerned that she is betraying him. He's going to be drinking heavily. There's absolutely no doubt about that. He's got nothing to lose now. He thinks he's lost her. He thinks she's having an affair entirely incorrectly. Where does he go now? What does he do? You can just see the writing on the wall. This is going to be enough to give him the fuel to the fire. Claire tells parents that she has to go out. Andrew won't allow her to go into the bedroom, and he's insisting on watching TV in the living room. He's leaving her no choice. For Taverner, this was confirmation of his suspicion that Claire was having an affair. But Claire explained to her parents that she had to go out, that Taverner wouldn't let her in the bedroom. He had control of the television in the living room. She had nowhere else to go. On the 6th of January, she tells her parents that she's moving out that weekend. Andrew finds out. It's a turning point. He wasn't going to get the relationship back with Claire. And at that point, people like Andrew become really quite dangerous. So this point, he knows that his physical strength, the only thing he's got, is not going to force her back to him. So 
he seems to start thinking about how he's going to resolve this whole issue. And it seems that he starts to decide that it's gonna be through physical violence. Andrew and Claire fight again, this time over who would look after the children. Andrew wants to go on a trip to Weymouth with his pool team. It was the weekend that everything started to unravel. That first day, Claire told her father that she and Tavana had agreed to separate, that she wasn't sorry about it. The marriage had run its course. It transpired that the couple had agreed to stay together for Christmas, but now that that was over, they were definitely separating. Tavner actually goes and plays pool with his friends in Weymouth, and he's very fixated about the relationship. Again, he's talking to them about how his relationship has fallen apart, how he's been crying. So he is very distressed, and he's sharing that information, which means that it's constantly on his mind. During this time, he starts drinking incredibly heavily. He starts telling his friends that his world is falling apart. Andrew is drinking heavily. They were all drinking. It's not uncommon when the team travels to tournaments, but friends remember Andrew was drinking a lot. A number of those uh, teammates uh, gave evidence in relation to uh, his consumption of alcohol. He drank both on the journey to the pool tournament in Weymouth, drank during the pool tournament, and then prior to boarding the coach for the return journey to Bristol, uh, purchased more alcohol and snacks for the journey home, and on uh, return to Bristol, uh, went into a public house when others perhaps suggested he would be better off going home. But in his words, he was going to get wasted. For Merrin and her partner, Kevin, that weekend is seared into their memories. What could they have done differently to protect Claire? On the last day of the season for County Pool, um, the men were away to Weymouth and Andy was on the coach with them all. They'd started drinking in the morning, which was customary to their outing. And um, on the way back on the coach, Andy had said to my partner, Kevin, that he'd split with his wife and he didn't want to split with her. Merrin liked Andrew Tavener. He was a regular in the pub and a good friend of her partner. She was surprised to learn that the Taverners were splitting up. She told Kevin to make sure Andrew knew he could stay at their pub if he needed to. As they put their children to bed that night, Merrin heard the whole story from Kevin. And he had said to a couple of his teammates that he was gonna go home and kill his wife. And they didn't think anything of it because, well, they didn't know that he was splitting with his wife. He had told Kevin, but he hadn't told the other guys. There's a lot of drinking this weekend and he starts saying things that people remember afterwards, saying things like, he's, he's going to stab Claire. On the journey home, uh, Mr. Tavener continued very much on the same theme in relation to his relationship with Claire and told a different friend that if Claire continued to uh, argue with him when he returned home, he would stab her and kill her. How could Andrew's friends have known what was going to happen? He was their charming, charismatic friend, the gentle giant. Yes, he's making threats, but does he really mean them? So here we are now, it's the 7th of January. He's drunk. He's telling his friends that he wants to get a knife and stab his wife. Did he mean it? It's not unusual that people who have decided to kill their partners start to talk about it and start to tell people of their plans. People don't tend to believe them, don't think they're serious, think, oh, they've had too much to drink, you know. But these threats really, really should be, should be taken seriously by anybody who hears them. What people tend to do is they see the best in the people that they know. So their friend's expectation is that, well, he'd never act on this. This is just a drunken ramblings. But actually, it's those moments that separate the opportunity of making a change to this situation. And people should take this kind of threat very seriously. He's using language that, that is quite absolute. My world is falling apart. He's, he's kind of saying he can't live without this woman, without this relationship. And that kind of suggests where his, his thinking is going. He does not see a future without that relationship. The night of January the 7th, Claire is at home. The children are asleep in bed. So Andrew goes home. He's got a plan. We don't know exactly what that plan was, but we do know he had a knife with him. 
a wooden handled large lock knife. We don't know exactly how it happens, but there's clearly a big row, a big violent row with tragic consequences. Andrew is very drunk and he's angry. He calls Claire's father. He said, you need to take your daughter back and the sooner the better. Mr. Taverner had returned home by about 20 to nine on the evening of the 7th of January. We know that by virtue of a conversation he had with Claire's father, there was some conversation in relation to Mr. Taverner suggesting that Claire uh, needed to leave the property. He made mention that Claire was a nice woman um, in relation and a fabulous daughter, but she could not remain at the house with him. It's almost like he's wanting to punish her. And she says to her dad, oh, ignore him, he's drunk. She's used to these kind of dramatic, melodramatic outbursts from him. Remember that Claire has had a history with Tavner drinking and obviously at times being threatening. So even though her father relays this to Claire, Claire doesn't feel that she's any imminent danger. Claire had no way of knowing that today was different she doesn't know that he's carrying a knife. So by the time he walks through the door to start arguing with Claire, he's not meeting her at an equal scenario where they then start to argue about a particular issue. He has been arguing with her all day in his head. He's at fever pitch when he arrives home. That's what makes him hugely dangerous. Her father knows something isn't right. He tries texting Claire. Claire's father, after receiving that telephone call, had some concerns about the state of the relationship between his daughter and Mr. Taverner, and therefore made contact uh, both by text and by a social media platform, just to reassure himself that she was all right. Uh, Claire was the uh, type of phone user that would have replied uh, immediately, and uh, he received no reply, and therefore, Shortly before 10 o'clock, uh, Claire's father made the short walk from his home to hers to see if he could see if everything was all right. On his arrival at uh, Claire's home, the house was in darkness and very quiet, and so Claire's father didn't uh, knock the door or go into the property. Her father returns home thinking that he'll check on the couple in the morning. Both Claire and her father hoped for the best. Andrew Tavener, though, was preparing for the worst. There's this argument. He's armed with a knife. What happened next was inevitable. Tavener had told his friends that he was going to go home and start a row. He told them that he was going to take a knife and stab his wife. It appears that's exactly what he did. He stabbed Claire 10 times. This is a violent and ferocious sustained attack. 10 stab wounds into the neck and the chest, those in the chest being fatal. Claire died at the scene from her injuries. The post-mortem confirmed that she'd sustained four stab wounds in a sustained attack, two to her neck and two to her chest. She also had a number of defensive injuries from an attempt to fend off her husband. Taverner sees only one way out. He walks out of the house, leaving his children to find the body of their mother. A 999 call was made to the emergency services by Claire's elder son, who was age six at the time. And in that call, he was able to say that his mother was dead, thinking, using the words, my mummy's dead, she's covered in blood. 6.55 a.m. on the 8th of January, 2018. Claire's children let paramedics into their home. Whilst all this is going on, there's no sight of Andrew Taverner. He's gone, he's fled, he's into the wind. Will Andrew Taverner face justice? When he approached Mr. Taverner, the train driver, uh, said, what have you been doing? Uh, he indicated that he just wanted to die. Claire Taverner lies dead on her living room floor. Emergency services turned up at the premises and were let in by the boys, still in their pajamas, to be met with what would only be described as a 
entirely horrific scene. Obviously, there was the terribly, brutally injured Claire. This must have been truly shocking for all concerned. Police and paramedics found the younger boy sat on the sofa, biting his nails and looking very frightened. Uh, both boys were asked where uh, their father was, and the elder boy was able to say that Daddy had been out playing pool, but usually would be home by now, and then made the unsolicited comment that but Daddy wouldn't have done this. Claire's father arrives to check on her. He hasn't heard from her since she told him there was nothing to worry about just before nine o'clock the previous evening. He and the police suspected they knew the culprit for the murder of Claire Taverner. We can assume that when police arrived and discovered no sign of forced entry, and of course spoke to Claire's father and understood about the issues that the couple were having with their relationship, that their prime suspect would have been Taverner. But Andrew Taverner is missing. Andrew Taverner has fled. He is desperate. He wants to end his life. At 7.10 a.m. that day, call handlers received a 999 call from a commuter at Nailsea and Backwell Station. The commuter reported seeing a man lying on the tracks. Mr. Taverner was first seen at 10 past seven at Nailsea and Backwell Station, where a commuter saw him, asked him what he was doing. And he lies down on the tracks because he has a full intention, that is a full intention of taking his own life as well. Word quickly gets around the small, tight-knit community. Something's wrong. And um, well, the first thing I heard was the following morning, my sister rang me to tell me that Andy Tavs had been at the train station and that his wife had died and that he tried to jump in front of a train. And we all thought that he'd gone home drunk, that had a row, and he had, she'd fallen down the stairs or something, because obviously the Andy we knew was a gentle giant. You, you wouldn't think he would do something like that. At no point did it even enter our mind that he would actually do something like that. And then we thought he'd jumped in front of the train because he felt so bad about what he'd done that he didn't see life himself. And then when we found out what he'd actually done, well, we were all in shock. We just couldn't believe it, none of us. Criminologist Jane Moncton-Smith believes that rather than feeling an overwhelming sense of guilt, it was the humiliation and desire to save face that drove Andrew Taverner to lie down on the tracks that morning. I think the very idea that he wanted to kill himself shows that he did not want to face up. He didn't want to face people with what he'd done. He's probably quite humiliated, in fact, that he had killed his wife. It wasn't shameful, didn't, no guilt. This was all about how small he was going to look in other people's eyes. Now, he absolutely knew that people were going to look at him and think, you awful, terrible man. Couldn't face his children. So he decided, in a very melodramatic fashion, that he was going to kill himself by laying across the railway tracks. But like with everything in, in this man's life, it's all bluster and, and, and it's all drama. He's not really a strong man. He's not really a big man. And it could be that at the end, he couldn't, couldn't actually see it through. Andrew Taverner's suicide attempt did not succeed. He lies on the train tracks, but appears to twist away from the train, severely damaging his right hand. Taverner ends up with the five fingers on his right hand missing. The same five fingers and right hand that he used to kill his wife. And Taverner then ends up in hospital, not a prison. So Taverner becomes a victim in his mind. At 7.30 a.m., barely half an hour after Claire's body is found, police arrest Andrew Taverner for her murder. The police were called to Nelsey uh, Station and uh, on their arrival, they arrested Mr. Taverner on suspicion of murder. Mr. Taverner's response to that was that there was no suspicion about it, that he had killed his wife. And he said, I've murdered her. Uh, yes, I did it. He tells police what he's done. When Taverner was approached by police at the train station, he instantly confessed to murdering his wife. He said, there's no suspicion about it. I did it, I killed her. But that is the last time Andrew Taverner will show any remorse. When interviewed by Avon and Somerset police, he refuses to answer. Despite evidence, despite witnesses, he denies ever hurting his wife. 
On February the 1st, Taverner was formally charged with Claire's murder. He'd replied no comment to all questions put to him during police interviews. On the day of the court case, Andrew Taverner changed his tune. On March the 8th, Andrew Taverner pleaded guilty to the murder of his wife. This was only 35 days after being charged. The defence put forward in terms of mitigation that this was an end of a relationship, that uh, he couldn't really remember what had happened, but accepted what he had done. On April the 10th, the judge sentenced Taverner to life imprisonment with a minimum of 16 years and eight months to serve. In summing up, the judge described Taverner's conduct as self-centered and cruel. He said, you left your wife's body in the house in the full knowledge that your young children would find her. The whole relationship, the marriage, his life, this murder, everything was ego-driven with this man. And I think the judge kind of said that when he was sentencing him. After Claire's death, the community struggled to come to terms with her murder. The pub where she had worked closed its doors as a mark of respect. Merrin, her partner, and the pool team who had spent those final days with Taverner had to come to terms with their part in witnessing the beginning of the evening. Just complete and utter shock, really. A lot of people, well, all of us really felt really bad because we all thought we could have stopped it if he hadn't gotten back to Nailsey, if he'd stayed here for the night, he could have thought differently the next day. And I think everybody felt really like they could have stopped it in some way. Her family was forever changed the day that Andrew Taverner bragged of his intention to kill. A community too. Neither can be certain exactly what had made him do it. What caused the ferocity of the attack, I don't think anybody could answer, apart from Mr Taverner himself.